Have you ever thought, hey, I want a terminal-based OpenStreetMaps client? And if the answer to that question is no, well, that's the correct answer because it's actually a really bad idea. But that doesn't mean it's not a fun idea, and that's what today's software is going to achieve. So this is Mapski, which is basically an OpenStreetMaps client in your terminal. Now, the way it describes itself is as this right here. So a Node.js based vector tile to Braille and ASCII renderer for Xterm compatible terminals. That is a absolute mouthful to say, and a lot of these terms don't really make any sense without some extra context, so I'll explain those a bit later in the video. But just keep in mind for now that it is basically an OpenStreetMaps client in your terminal. Now, if we want to test this out, there's a couple of ways we can go about doing this. We don't actually have to install it. We can just telnet into this server. And if you don't know what telnet is, that makes sense because it's generally not used on the public internet anymore because basically it was the, I guess, the predecessor to SSH. And there's a very good reason why SSH came to replace it. So this article here basically does a good job at explaining everything that's wrong with Telnet and why you should use SSH instead. But the main reason is that a Telnet connection isn't encrypted. So instead of using Telnet here, let's just assume that this is an SSH client and an SSH server, and we have a connection between the two of them. So if you try to send something across that connection, what's gonna happen is the data is gonna be encrypted based on an algorithm and the key that you use to encrypt it. And then when it gets to the other side, it's basically going to be decrypted on that side. Now, if someone tries to look at that connection, in theory, they shouldn't be able to understand what the data is without knowing what the decryption key is. But when you're using Telnet, there isn't any decryption key, there isn't any encryption at all. All they have to do is look at the connection and say, okay, this is the data that's being sent across, and they can see exactly what you've sent. So if we go a bit further down, we can see a bit of an example of how this would work. Basically, this person is just doing a Telnet connection, and then they have a network traffic analysis tool and you can see exactly what data they've actually been sending across. But in this case, it doesn't actually matter because all we're doing in Mapski is we're being sent map location data and we're sending back which chunk we want to download. So there's nothing really of value that is actually being sent back and forth. Obviously, if you went and found exactly where your house was, maybe that's a bit of a problem, but that's really the only attack vector that could exist. Now, if you'd rather not use Telnet though, you can go and run it locally with NPX, or you can go and install it through NPM or through Snap. And then if you've installed it, basically to run it, all you have to do is run Mapski. So let's actually see how this would work. We're just gonna Telnet into it, and then I'll switch over to the NPX version, just because that's a little bit nicer to use. So I'll copy this right here, go over to my second screen, and paste this command in right here. Cool, so give it a second to go. Now obviously this is gonna depend on how busy the server is today and how quick your internet connection is based on how nice it's gonna to be to use really. But as you can see, it has a uh, fun rendering problems because obviously it's gonna take time to re-download each new, I guess, view of the map. So every time you move, it's gonna to try to re-download something. So it's not the uh, greatest experience to use this through Telnet, but it can be done. So let's just zoom in on something. Let's zoom in on Australia and let's find, let's find, I don't know, the uh, Smithfield train station. Sure, we can do that. So that's Modbury there. And let's go a bit further in. That's Salisbury, Gola, it'll be up this way. So we have Manapara here. And as you can see, we zoom in and now we've actually got a view of the roads. We don't have road names, but we do have uh, suburb names. So we have things like Manapara West, Andrews Farm, Manapara, Smithfield. It's uh, not the greatest experience to see all of this because the way it's rendering this is through Unicode Braille, which I'll talk about in just a bit. I only found out about this fairly recently, but let's just keep going with what we're doing. Oh, it's closed the connection. So let's go and try it through NPX instead. So NPX Mapski. And this, you're gonna notice, is a much, much nicer experience to use. So, as you can see, it's not freaking out when I try to move around quickly. It does say the renderer is busy, so this will also depend on how quickly your system can actually render the map. It shouldn't be too big of a deal on any modern hardware, but if you're using this on something a bit older, it could be a bit of an issue. And one thing you'll also notice is the map actually is cyclic, so it's not gonna stop us at some arbitrary border where it wants to cut the map in half. No, what it's going to do is just let you keep going all the way to the right or all the way to the left and it's just going to basically take you back to where you started, which is always nice to see with a map. 
So let's try to get back to where we were. Now I was testing this a bit off camera, so it has actually cached a bit of the map. So it is going to be a bit quicker for me, but if we keep zooming in, there we go, it's going to have a bit of a problem now. As you saw, when we tried to zoom in there, it had to re-download a bit of the map. So when it has to re-download anything, it is going to be a bit slow, especially when you start getting to some of the more like complex things like this. So now we can see some of the roads in here, but if we keep going a bit further, we might hit a point where it has to re-download a bunch. Here we go. So now we have to wait for it to download, and now it's downloaded a bunch of extra information. So as you can see, we're back to where we were. So let's try to find the Smithfield Railway Station just so I can show you that it actually does show the roads. I did mention that it didn't, but it actually does show road names. You just have to be in really close. So here we go, Smithfield Railway Station here. It shows the bus stop as well, that's cool. And as you can see, now we've zoomed in far enough, we can see things like John Street and Samuel Street. And for some reason, the, uh, the ramp of the train station has a street name. I don't know why it does, but I guess it does. And if we keep zooming in, we can even see things like roundabouts here. So we've got uh, Morialta Drive, Charlotte Street, Anderson Walk, and Anderson Walk. So this is actually a really, really cool piece of software. Now, that doesn't mean that it is a useful piece of software. It's more like a cool experiment to see that it can actually work. When I was testing this earlier, I did notice some slight weird rendering problems in some places. Let's see if we can recreate them. So if we go down to Kangaroo Island, I should be able to show you it. Uh, Kangaroo Island is... where is the York Peninsula? York Peninsula is down here. Oh, there you go. As you can see, there's this weird land bridge that generates between the York Peninsula and Kangaroo Island. And I, I don't know why this happens, because we zoom out just a bit it disappears, we zoom in just a bit more, and it disappears. So there's this weird period in here where there's this weird land bridge that decides to generate. I don't know if this is a problem with the OpenStreetMaps map data, or if this is a problem with the renderer, or what's going on here, but I haven't noticed it show up in any other locations, it just seems to show up right here. So, I don't know, that's, that's a little bit weird to see. And because we've already got the map open, I guess I can show you an Australian town that has an absolutely amazing name. So up near Port Augusta and Wyala, there is a town called Iron Knob. So hello to all of my listeners in Iron Knob. I love the name of your town. Now you might have noticed that I've been moving around with my mouse. So yes, this does actually support mouse click events. So your terminal does need to support them to actually use this feature. But if it doesn't, you can also move around with the arrow keys. So it's a bit slower, but I guess it also works. I'd prefer to just move around with the mouse though because it's much quicker. Now, I was zooming in by using the mouse scroll wheel, but once again, if your terminal doesn't support mouse events, then you can zoom in by pressing A, and you can zoom out by pressing Z. Now, I don't know why those are the bindings, but they're the bindings they chose. And if we go back to the GitHub page for just a moment, you'll notice that it doesn't just support a Braille rendering mode, it also supports an ASCII rendering mode. So if we want to switch over to that, all we have to do is press C. And as you'll notice, this doesn't look as nice. So the way it's doing this rendering is through ASCII block characters. And it's usable in this state. But let's go a bit further down to Adelaide. And as you'll see, it's it's a mess. Let's go... Actually, let's go into the suburbs. Go back to Smithfield and see how bad it can look. So... <laughs> this, this is how bad it can look. So I'm not a big fan of the ASCII block rendering, but if you want to use them instead, then that is also an option as well. Before we end off the video, there's a few things I want to explain. So you might be wondering what a vector tile is. Now a vector tile is basically a way to send a chunk of geographic data to a client. Now the way a vector tile differs from a raster tile is that a vector tile basically describes how to draw a section of map, whereas a raster tile is basically an image of a section of map. Now there's a couple of benefits to using vectors over rastered images. One is that for a program like this, you can very easily change how the different lines are drawn in a vector. And the other thing is that with a vector, you can increase the size as much as you want and you lose no quality whatsoever because all a vector is doing is specifying how to draw an image. Whereas a rastered image is a set size and if you try to increase that size, basically it's gonna have to guess what those pixels should look like. And the other thing is that in the Unicode standard, there actually are Braille characters. I didn't know about this until really recently. So if you somehow don't know what Braille is, 
I'm not sure how you don't know what Braille is. Basically, it's a way for people who struggle with sight or who are blind to actually read. So I didn't know that this was a part of the Unicode standard. It makes sense that it is, but I'd never really looked into it. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to talk about in this video. Now, someone's probably going to say, you just padded out this video. You should have just done like a five minute video on Mapski and that's all it should have been. But I felt like providing some extra value because maybe you don't know what Telnet is. Maybe you don't know what vector tiles are. Maybe you didn't know about Unicode Braille. I felt like there was some extra stuff I could talk about that maybe would add a bit of extra value to you guys and hopefully you'll learn something new from this because even if you don't think that Mapski is a useful piece of software, which I, I don't really think it is, but maybe you learned something new about, say, Telnet, or you learned something new about vector tiles, or any of the other stuff I talked about. So, hopefully you got something useful out of this video. But before I go, I want to thank my patrons. So, a special thank you to Joachim, Nathan, Andrew, Peter Lee, Rode, Tony Donald, Oculari, and Zilver. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to that down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gear in this channel, or anything else you want, and I'll get a small kickback for it. Also remember to go check out my podcast, that is Tech of a T, available on Library and BitTube, and also this channel, which is available on Library, BitTube, and now also BitChute. So feel free to go check out my content on any of those platforms. Also remember to go smash the like button and leave me a comment down below, and remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.